Hello YouTube, I'm PCJ Law and here's my 10 tips you can use to step up to and thrive on Deity Difficulty. These tips aim to debunk some of the ways in which you see good players do things, but you can't quite work out how they won so fast in the late game. In the background, I'll show you images from a game I started with a generic Civ of me demonstrating some of these tips. Let's begin with my secret 11th and 12th tips. Tip 0. Civ is not only about building the best empire eventually, it's about balancing empire strength with getting there fast enough. I can build a 10 city empire that's better than my opponent's 3 city empire, but it means nothing if they build the spaceship before my empire develops into its overwhelming strength. If you want to get really good at Civ, you need to start thinking about balancing empire strength with getting there fast enough. And tip 0.5, aim for 4 or more cities, 1 city per luxury. Too many players found 3 cities or less, it's super easy for cities to pay themselves back and more in terms of science. 4 to 5 cities tends to be a great balance between the easy playability of fewer cities and having enough cities to take fast enough. There are plenty of ways to gain happiness to go 1 city per luxury and sometimes even 4 cities on 3 luxuries. So found cities on any reasonable spot where you think you've got enough luxuries to support it. And now with those two secret tips out of the way, let's get on to the real ones. So. Tip 1. Settling your capital. Settling in place is underrated. Too many players concentrate on what they gain and forget what they lose by moving. On Legendary Star, you never need to move as the game is rigged to give you tons of resources around your capital. On Strategic Balance, your guaranteed nodes of horses and iron will add a minimum of two great tiles to work. On other settings, the game works to choose you a good enough location anyway. You can move for a few things, although I would generally advise you move for a mountain, a hill start, settling on a luxury or a river system. But be aware, you don't want to move too far away from your tiles which have two or more food. You'll wreck your start if you don't give yourself the two two plus food tiles you need to grow to pop three in the early game. Settling place is never too bad. You can move, but check that you still get the crucial things you need early game. Two two plus food tiles within your first two rooms to grow to population three, and some hills to work to build settlers. In this example game here, you can see that our start is perfectly fine. We're starting on a hill, we've got a bonus resource in the stone, and we've got a 2-2 food tile so that we can grow to population 3. And we have two hills within our first ring, which allow us to get enough production to build settlers. Tip 2. Early build order. I always start with two scouts, especially on my games where I'm playing on the base Pangea with small map size. This helps with three crucial things. One revealing settling locations so you know which spots are contested and should be settling first. Two, taking ancient ruins which can be big early game boosts and three is having units just to do stuff. You need units in order to protect tiles, escort settlers and steal a worker. In general you need at least three or more units to do this. Without three units and scouts are the cheapest unit you can build which is why they're so great, you'll find it difficult to perform all of these jobs with the units you have. If you have a small amount, now this can be broken by a couple of exceptions. Um, if you have a small amount of land to manage, say an isolated peninsula or an island or a smaller map, you can get away with fewer. But in general, if you want to be able to scout all of the land to find where you want to settle your cities, if you want to take a fair amount of ancient ruins and not give away your ruins to someone else, and if you want to be able to protect tiles, escort settlers and steal a worker, you want to have at least three units and scouts built straight away can be the cheapest way to do this. Next, after you build your two scouts, the question is what do you build next? I usually work, I usually choose between three things. One is a shrine, two is a monument, and three is a worker. The shrine is always top priority, and that is built if I can grab a good faith, culture, or food pantheon. The benefits from one of these great pantheons can be easily felt early in the game and turn out to be really, really powerful, so you get one if you can. However, if you can't get one, then there's no reason to build a shrine quite yet, and instead you can move on to one of the other two items. The second priority item being a monument. If I don't need a shrine, and I didn't get a culture rune yet, I will build a monument, and that's because building this monument can save you 10 turns to completing tradition. Now a lot of people will advise, they'll be like, you know you don't need to build a monument if you're going tradition because you can get the free monument from legalism. Yes you can, but if you don't pick up a culture in, in the early game, you will probably end up finishing tradition you know, somewhere after turn 70, up to 10 turns later than if you didn't build your monument. 
I like building the monument and in my two fastest ever deity victory games, I built a monument straight after my two scouts. So for me, this works and so I like to do it. I build a monument if I don't need a shrine and didn't get a culture in yet. It can save you up to 10 turns on finishing tradition. And third is the worker. If I don't need a shrine or a monument, I build a worker. And workers really are the gift that keeps on giving. Workers can chop forests to accelerate your production for building settlers and workers add yields to tiles. Building an early worker allows you to keep your happiness up and sort of you know, allows you to grow faster than you might have done otherwise because you can get your luxuries online sooner and they improve your tiles so you get your settlers out faster. They really are the gift that keeps on giving and is why stealing a worker in the game is so ex in the early game is so exceptionally powerful. Now, we can't get past early build orders without talking about one building which is the source of many debate within many a debate within the Civ community, and that's a granary. I never build a granary before I built a settler. Ever. It doesn't boost settler production enough to offset the time spending it. Granary is one of these things which they really do tend to be overrated. But the benefits of getting your settles out early and faster are worth a lot more than the granary, which is really only worth two or three two or three food to you in the early game. And that two or three food will be worth two hammers at most. But remember, you have to spend six turns building the granary. Tip three, prefer tradition. Liberty works less often than you think. This is a base game tip as mods alter the balance. But in my opinion, you don't go tradition for tool and liberty for wide. Tradition is for building four or fewer settlers before National College, and Liberty is for five or more settlers before National College. This is because Tradition wins in happiness, growth, gold, and free early buildings that are ultra priority in the Monument and Aqueduct. At worst, it provides you with a core of strong cities, and there's a tip later on in this video to explain why that's useful. Liberty wins in hammers and culture thanks to 33% decreased cost of social policies. You can also get a free great person which can be a scientist or an engineer for a high priority wonder. Liberty only wins in happiness when you get to 9 or 10 cities and even then the amount of happiness that you earn really is marginal. So in my opinion, tradition wins hard in the important things so we'll only choose liberty when tradition would fail and that's when building too many early settlers. Spending too long building early settlers makes your national college too late and sets you back too far in the getting there fast enough section of my tip zero. However, early cities are powerful enough that taking liberty to speed up settler production and to guarantee the spots you want gives you enough benefits to offset losing tradition. However, if you can afford to settle the extra expands after national college because you can give them help, a tip we'll reference later, and the spots aren't contested, then it's better to take the better social policy tree, which in this case is tradition. Tip 4. Build settlers at population 3. Growing to population 4 is significantly harder than growing to population 3. Population 4 is like the early granary discussion we had earlier. It doesn't boost settler production enough to offset the time spent growing to it. The empire-wide bonuses from getting your cities out earlier outweigh the bonus to your capital for getting to pop 4 early. We're thinking bonuses like the increased population from your expands boosting your science. Bonuses like getting your expands out earlier means they finish their libraries earlier, which means you can build your national college sooner. Bonuses like getting your expands out earlier reduces the chance of you losing that expansion spot to someone else. Those are just some reasons why building at settlers at pop three tends to be incredibly useful. And that brings us straight on to tip five. Population three is the sweet spot in the early game, so don't be afraid to production focus when you're there. There's definite benefit in getting through your early, early game building queue, and growth gets so much more efficient with the tradition finisher that your time is better spent building, granar building granaries and libraries than growing an extra population. One of the key things to remember here is, apart from the fact that you know, growth is so much more efficient once you've got to the tradition finisher, is that you get 9 base happiness and plus 4 for every luxury that you have online. That means if you take the recommended one luxury per city and have a four city empire, then growing to population three in all of your cities leaves you with one leftover happiness. Growing is worthless if you don't have the happiness, so production focusing at pop three loses you nothing in this situation, whilst allowing you to get through your building queue faster. I used to always struggle with getting through my building queue, but ever since I started making this small change, which is just recognizing quite how useful pop quite how, I guess, 
difficult it is to grow from population three to population four and production focusing to get my granaries and libraries out, I've started having much fewer problems with my building queue, even in cities which have really low production. And this game was actually quite a nice demonstration of that. Tip six, early internal food trade routes. I like to find the time to build early caravans or cargo ships. One built from the capital before the National College, and one built in an expand as soon as possible after the expand has built a library. The first one is used to accelerate growth in the capital. And that's because having a tall capital has lots of benefits. Notably, it goes well with one of the tradition policy with one of the tradition policies which gives you half unhappiness for every two citizens in the capital. And then the second is just because getting your cities bigger earlier is just always better. The second trade route, what you do with that is really up to you. And it depends on if you need more growth in the capital, at which point you send it to the capital, or if you want to boost and expand to make it a strong early production city for your empire. There's definite benefit in having two great early production cities as opposed to just the one because your capital is going to be busy with a lot of things. The second trade route might also be used to secure an important city-state alliance. If a city-state that is really valuable to you, say a cultural city-state or a mercantile city-state or a maritime city-state or a faith city-state, and it has a trade request that will allow you to get strongly into friends or even into the alliance territory, then sending the second trade route to that city-state can often have a lot of benefits. This does mean taking sailing as soon as you're ready to build that second trade route. However, I promise you, the second trade route from sailing is more valuable than saving that small amount of science gained from ignoring it. And in fact, once you're in or close to the Renaissance era, I think the compass trade route is often more valuable than neglecting to tech both optics and compass. Tip seven, fast national college. Aim to have it built by turn 67 on quick speed or turn 100 on standard speed. There are reasons, and usually for early growth and extra expands, where delaying it past turn 67 is okay, but national college jumpstarts your science. Remember, in Civ, you need to balance empire strength with getting there fast enough. National College adds so much science that getting it past turn 70 tends to be too detrimental to the getting there fast enough strategy. Delaying it, however, is definitely an exception to the rule. Don't be afraid to switch to libraries without finishing your granary if you need to. Ideally, you want all your libraries up between turn 55 and 60, as the National College can take up to 10 turns to build in your capital. In this example here, we actually get our National College on turn 70, which is a bit late. However, that's made up for in the fact that some of my X-Bands are a little bit larger than I would normally expect for this time in the game. In this case, we traded a slightly later National College for getting things like early workers and granaries out before libraries and then the libraries out. So we have a specific reason why it was allowed to be a little bit late, but I promise you, I didn't want it to be this late. Tip eight, late cities are okay, but they need help. Pre-National College expansions tend to be all right on their own since they benefit from early growth and getting through their building queue. These tend to be the cities that you can work scientist specialists in. One thing that you often find is that cities settled late or post-National College don't have the room to actually work these scientist specialists and scientist specialists are crucial for your great scientist generation, which helps, you, helps power you towards your end game, game winning technologies. Post-National College expansions are actually detrimental to your empire early on, but they're settled because their late game benefits outweigh the early disadvantages. This counts for cities taken via war too. The post-national college expansions block you from building things like Circus Maximus and Ironworks, and they place a strain on your happiness since they're not ready to build their own happiness buildings quite yet, and especially at a time when you're starting to see your happiness really, really struggle. Acquiring new cities after your national college is the classic way players ruin their ability to complete the get there fast enough section of my tip zero. However, you can get them there fast enough by providing them help. The help comes in the form of internal trade routes and purchasing buildings. If your city has loads of hammer tiles, send it a food trade route so you can work them. If your city has loads of food tiles, say a coastal city with many fish, send it a production trade route so you can get, your, get through your buildings fast enough. Late cities need to grow and to get through their building queue much faster than an early city. Help them, or they'll either cause you to not get there fast enough, or they won't be ready to contribute by the time you reach the end game. In this example, I didn't actually have a late city settled post-national college. However, I did have my one city, Troyes or Troyes, however you pronounce it in French, which was really starting to flag. It needed help, 
so I sent it help. And this is one of those classic cases. It wouldn't have been big enough to work specialist, specialist slots, and it would have struggled in the late game if I didn't get enough population C. Tip nine. Stop thinking about wide versus tall. Instead, think more cities is always better, provided you can get them tall enough soon enough. The reason wide versus tall is a suboptimal line of thought, in my opinion, is because cities that aren't tall enough can't contribute to the late game, where games of Civ are won and lost. If a city needs to build a spaceship part, 20 turns is way too slow. If a city needs to build units, 8 turns for an XCOM means it won't arrive in time to be useful. Remember, you need to get things done fast enough. 3 XCOMs sooner is definitely better than 4 XCOMs later. A balance of wide versus tall gives the best trade-off between overall empire strength and getting there fast enough. So in my opinion, you need a core of 3 to 4 cities that are tall, so you can build units or spaceship parts fast enough, and then the remaining cities that be tall enough so that they can actually contribute units. Extra cities almost always pay themselves back in science, which is why more cities is always better, but you need a core set of tall cities to get stuff done fast, but the remainder need to be tall enough to contribute. If I were to give some guidelines, your capital needs to get to pop 25 or greater, and your other core tall cities need to be pop 18 or greater, however pop 20 plus is definitely preferable, and your tall enough cities need to be pop 15 plus. This gives you the balance between tall cities to get stuff done fast and make sure your remaining cities aren't too small to be a detriment to your empire. You can see in the example that I've got on screen now how my spaceship parts in my slower cities are actually being built in 17 turns. That is ridiculously slow and is, you know, and this kind of shows how cities that get to 19 pop can definitely have such low production that they really struggle to contribute in the late game. These cities would be the ones that build things like XCOM squads or stealth bombers or bombers or infantry or any units that you need way too slow. So they do need to be big enough. And this is why you don't ever want to think about wide versus tall and instead think go, go as wide as I can, but get tall enough. And it's so that your cities can actually contribute things fast enough. You know, they're not the cities that are delaying all sorts of things that you don't need to delay. And finally, tip 10 is building early wonders. Free National College is an exception to the rule. Deity teaches you that you don't need wonders at all to win a game of Civ, but since they give you bonuses you can't get otherwise, they can be very powerful for your game. However, you can lose out on world wonders, and even successfully building one can inhibit your ability to get through your building queue. It's no good if Hanging Gardens delays your National College by 10 turns and uses up the time you could have spent building a caravan. Your building queue is fragile, is what I like to say, so protect it. If you are to build a wonder, don't lose it. Learn to check tech costs and only build wonders that no one else has the tech for yet. That brings me to the end of this video. So let me know which of the tips you thought were useful or new to you or which you disagree with. These are what I used to successfully win this game as an objectively poor Civ of France on mediocre lands on turn 186 on deity difficulty. This game shows that with mediocre lands it's possible to win and win fast and your cities don't have to be spectacular if you balance building a strong empire with getting there fast enough. In a bit of a summary of this game though, my turn timings were at National College on turn 70. That's slow, but the population in my expands helped make up for it. Universities were built on turn 84 in the capital and turn 90 in the expansions. That's fast, but I did it before building workshops and the fast universities really only made up for cities that will have been peaking too soon and as you can see in the end just really weren't quite good enough. Public schools are built on turn 123 in the capital, turn 128 in the expands, which I feel is fairly mediocre um, and there we were really feeling the effects of having slow rationalism in this game. And labs were built on turn, 50 and, turn 150 in the capital and turn 154 in the expands, which is pretty good to decent. And the spaceship finished on turn 186, not bad at all. The save file for this game will be linked in the description. Do like and subscribe if you liked this video or found it useful. It lets me know what content to keep making for you all. And please leave questions or suggestions in the comments below. Thanks for watching.